Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word about how the resurrection of Jesus should move us. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do two things for me? Number one, like this video. And number two, send a link to it to everyone that you know. Let's get as many people connecting with us on a weekly basis. All right. I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. So imagine you're sitting in a restaurant with your family and you're just relaxing and having a nice meal and all of a sudden the front doors of the restaurant burst open and somebody runs in full speed and says, good news everybody, I've got the greatest news ever. You're never going to guess what it is. And so the person jumps in and of course gets everyone's attention and proceeds to say one of two things, okay? The first bit of good news is you're never going to guess my daughter's been dying of cancer and the doctor just came and told me they found a cure this is incredible right scenario number two the person comes in and says this is the best news ever and this is a town where it was there was a large factory that had been offshored uh, because of globalization and so the majority of the town was out of business and people are depressed and it's just a really bad situation but the good news is that they found oil reserves in a place under the city and it will allow them to build a new factory that will employ 50,000 people dealing with oil refinement and all that's associated with it. So in other words, everyone is lifted out of poverty. Everyone is excited about it. In other words, the, 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 the future for that, that city is incredibly bright because of what they discovered. Okay. That is a great <laughs> depiction of the resurrection of Jesus. It's the greatest news ever. But what makes it really, really significant and distinctive is that it's something that happened, you know, 2,000 years ago, and yet what happened has consequence for us today and all generations moving forward. It's the best news ever, but it's something that we've got to receive by faith, because obviously we weren't there, uh, and it's something that we've got to hope for, to some degree, for all of the benefits of it. And so it's something that we need to understand more fully because we're supposed to be moved by the resurrection of Jesus every single day as Christians. And, and if you're like me, you know, you go through life. Life happens. Difficulties happen. Struggles happen. Sickness happens, right? And so there are times where I'll find myself, perhaps, <laughs> not in terribly moved by the resurrection, but we're supposed to be. And the great scripture that talks about this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul, the Apostle Paul elaborates on what the resurrection is and its implications for the Christian life. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 8. Let's read verses 1 through eight. It says this, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. 
For what I believe, what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then he appeared to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Can we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day, this Easter Sunday, in which we celebrate and remember and reflect upon the resurrection of Jesus and how it has a dramatic, life-changing effect on all of those uh, that receive him. But not just that, for everyone in the world, everything changed after the resurrection of Jesus. While it was not initially dramatic, time was separated from before Christ to after Christ because of this event. So God, I pray, as we talk about does the resurrection of Jesus move you, God? Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit wants to speak to us. I pray this now in Jesus' name. So we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And what we need to remember is, is that it, it is the best news ever, and we should never, ever forget that. Okay. So, so the word gospel is euangelion in the Greek, and it means good news. Uh, it fundamentally refers to the fact that the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus fundamentally alter the human condition and calls every man, woman, and child to account to what Jesus has done for us. That's the good news because it changed everything. Uh, death was destroyed, right? Uh, 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 Jesus, in all of the opposition against him, arose from the dead. And now the possibility that the sins of of the whole world can be forgiven is now a reality. That's the best news ever because the most fundamental need of humanity is not more money, is not more stuff, is not personal peace and affluence or comfort or luxury. The most fundamental need of humanity is to have their sins forgiven because they're separated from a life-giving relationship with the creator of the universe. And Jesus dying on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago and then being raised from the dead three days later reveals that he has opened up the way for every man, woman, and child to be in relationship with him. And the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2, Paul says, brothers, I, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you as if they were forgetting it already, as if they were forgetting the implications of it. And he said, by this gospel, you're saved if, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. And so he's saying that, listen, the resurrection needs to be the main thing in your mind all the time. That is supposed to move you. That is supposed to motivate you. That is supposed to help you, you know, get through the stuff and the struggles of life. Because if there's no resurrection from the dead, you're still under the tyranny of sin and death. And, and, and you are to be filled with you know, doubt and despair and worry and anxiety. And again, we go through stuff as Christians. We've all been anxious as a Christian. We've all worried as Christians. We've all been angry even after receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. But these... Um, these emotional responses to the struggles of life are meant to be the exception rather than the rule for the Christian in which the Spirit of God dwells inside of them because of the resurrection of Jesus, right? It says in Romans 8, 11, if the same Spirit of, of Jesus, the one that raised Jesus from the dead, dwells inside of you, that same Spirit will quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit which dwelleth in you. And so because of that, we can have constant victory over fear, worry, anxiety, despondency, depression, and fill in the blank, whatever we deal with, because the resurrection life of Jesus is inside of us, and it is capable of continuing to give us everything we need. And the thing about the gospel we need to understand, if I can get a little technical, is the gospel is an indicative. It's not an imperative. Now, that gets a little technical, but basically indicative and imperative are forms of uh, English grammar. In other words, something that's an imperative is you must do this. Okay, The gospel is not an imperative. It's not a you must do this, 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 and this, 
And then after doing all of that, you'll be accepted by God. But rather, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, is an indicative. It describes what happened. So we could say the first day of spring was last week. In 1945, the Allies defeated the Axis powers in World War II, right? It is an indicative. This happened, and so as a result of what happened, it affects our future. That's what the gospel is. That's what the resurrection of Jesus is. It's an indicative. It's something that happened. The gospel is something God has done for us. All we have to do is receive it. It's not an imperative. It's not like you've got to do this and you're going to be right with God. It's already been done. The righteousness of Christ received is what changes us. It's what makes us accepted before God. It's what brings us into a right relationship with God. That's the best news possible because we live in a works righteousness society. Right? Everything around us is about performance and accomplishments, right? Grades in school, or if you're in sports, you're trying to achieve and beat somebody and, 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 and you know, work hard on the field. All of that is, there's nothing wrong with that. But when that becomes the way you look at becoming right with God, that is not the gospel. The gospel is an indicative. It's something God in Christ has done for us and all we have to do is receive that. That's really, really good news. Second of all, we need to not forget that the gospel is supposed to impact us today. Okay, it says 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. All right. And so then when Paul says right after that, most historians will tell us this is most likely the most earliest hymn in Christian history that was written between three to five years after the resurrection. So it's very, very close in, in time to the resurrection of Jesus. And so what's of first importance? It's that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that's the heart of, of the Christian confession. Jesus died for us and was raised to life again. Now where this is significant is that, let's remember, Paul's writing this, but he didn't see it. Paul wasn't a believer in Jesus when Jesus died and when he was raised from the dead. He became a Christian later on. So he received this information from eyewitnesses, but he wasn't there. Okay? And so he's, in many respects, very similar to all of us today, 2,000 years removed. Right? Is, is that we weren't there. We didn't see the crucifixion. We didn't see the resurrection. All we have is the testimony of eyewitnesses as it's written down in the scriptures. Do we believe what was done? But not only do we believe, but do we allow it to really affect us in our everyday life? Because the scripture says in Hebrews 6, 9 through 10, talking about what Jesus has done for us. We have this hope as the anchor of the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so what this is revealing is after Jesus died, he ascended to heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of God. And where he's seated at the right hand of God, the Bible tells us, is the Holy of Holies, is the place where the very presence of God dwells. So the sacrifice of atonement that was prevented, presented in the Jewish temple framework could only be done once a year by the high priest. But Jesus being crucified and raised from the dead, the perfect, sinless, spotless Son of God, is now sitting at the right hand of God in the Holy of Holies, the very place where that atoning sacrifice is offered forever. He is forever the God Man, he bears the scars in his body on that cross that achieved our atonement. And so because of that, we are forgiven. Because of that, we are redeemed. Because of that, we are justified. Because of that, we are made right before God. Because he's always there. And the scripture tells us in Hebrews that he always lives to make intercession for us. In other words, God's got our back all the time. That is incredibly great news. And so we need to remember that as we're reflecting upon the resurrection. And it gives us, again, confidence to enter into his presence. That's why Hebrews 10, 19 says that we've got confidence to enter the most holy place 
by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. So what Hebrews 6 is talking about when Jesus sat at the right hand of God and he's always presented himself as that atoning sacrifice, that should give us great confidence to approach the Lord. But Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 15 to go through a litany of, of dynamics, if you will, of the resurrection that should motivate us, that should prompt us to be a people of faith and hope and, and victory. Because it says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Christ died for our sins. And so that is in the Greek aorist tense, which means it's past tense. He died. It's something in the past that happened. But what's really significant is when Paul says, and Jesus was raised on the third day. He was raised. The word there in the Greek is in the perfective tense. What is the perfective tense? The perfective tense is something that happened in the past, but has an effect on the future for all time. Okay, So what his, his being raised from the dead is not just something that happened in the past and it's done, like he died. But being raised means it continually affects us today. In fact, it's the same verb tense when Jesus is about to die. He says, it is finished. It's the Greek word tetelestai, which means, again, it's in the perfective tense. It is finished. I've accomplished this, but what is finished is going to continue to affect our future. And so when you look at the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, and again, time doesn't permit me to go through the litany of areas, but it talks about how the resurrection affects the present. Right? And in, in other words, here's a good one. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, it says, If Christ has not been raised, you're still dead in your sins. Meaning, because he was raised, you're not dead in your sins anymore. You are set free. He that the Son sets free is free indeed. And my favorite section of this is the back end of 1 Corinthians 15, where it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 49 and 50, it says this, just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we will also bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So it's telling us that our body, with all of our frailties and all of our limitations, and we get older, and we're not as sharp as we used to be, it's saying all of that is going to give way to an imperishable body. We're going to have the same resurrection body as Jesus. We're never going to die. We are never going to get old. <laughs> we are never going to be sorrowful. We are never going to be in pain. We're going to walk in an incredible level of life and existence that we've never ever touched before. It's coming for every single one of us. That's incredible. And it also says at the back end of this section in 1 Corinthians that because of the resurrection, we should be a people of hope. And because of the resurrection, every act of ministry in serving the Lord in a local church, serving people outside of the local church, is never, ever in vain. And can I, can I be candid with you? There are times when I've served in ministry, serving people, helping people, ministering to people, teaching people, preaching. What, and, and there are times that I've gone home and I've gone, God, am I making any difference in the world at all? Am I making a difference for the kingdom? And, and there are times that I've had to go, God, I, I don't think I am. But look what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 15. It says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters. Again, he's been reflecting on the resurrection for 57 verses before that, right? So therefore, because of the resurrection, look what he says. Stand firm, right? Don't be moved by struggles. It says, let nothing move you. Right? And, and that should be a good word for all of us because stuff tends to move us. Stuff, stuff tends to impact our lives. Difficulties, struggles, sicknesses, setbacks, right? Uh, people in our lives that, that disappoint us or whatever, right? But it says because of the resurrection, we should not be moved. And then it goes on to say, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That is a great word of encouragement for everyone that's in any kind of ministry anywhere. That there are times you feel like I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my efforts. I'm not making a difference. There's no change that's taking place for the kingdom. 
But Paul says, because of the resurrection, don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Don't quit. Every labor that you engage in is not in vain. It will have its intended effect. Be faithful to the Lord and you'll be fruitful. Stay faithful serving God because your labor is not in vain. I tell you what, if that's not encouraging, I don't know what is. And finally, as we're talking about does the resurrection move us, let's remember that it's supposed to be shared. Because look what it says in verses 5 through 8. As, as Paul talks about the resurrection and the crucifixion of Jesus and all of that, then he talks about all the witnesses that saw it. It, said, it says he appeared to Peter, and then the resurrected Jesus appeared to the twelve, and then the resurrected Jesus appeared to 500 brothers at the same time, and then he appeared to James and all the apostles. In other words, he had a dramatic impact on people's lives, and because of that impact, others began to share that gospel message. In fact, the entire New Testament is written by individuals who either directly or through uh, a, a, you know, an eyewitness testimony received Jesus, the resurrection power filled their lives and hearts, and they went around and told as many people as they could. So as we're asking ourselves, does the resurrection move us? I think a good question for me and a good question for you is, does the resurrection move me or move you enough that you share Jesus with people that you're around? This should be a very provocative question because the resurrection of Jesus forever changed the early disciples. They could not keep quiet. They kept preaching. They kept sharing. They kept, you know, uh, preaching the gospel wherever they, 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 they went and to everyone that would, would hear them, right? And that should motivate us to do the exact same thing. So as I close... The question before all of us is, does the resurrection move you? Is it moving you toward the good news that every day your life should be filled with good news despite sickness, despite struggle, despite setbacks? We've got the greatest news on the planet living inside of us because of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of the resurrected Jesus is living inside of us. So we should be a people of good news. Second of all, it should fill us with an absolute... Uh, incredible level of hope is that we can never be defeated because of the resurrection of Jesus, right? They, the Romans, the Jews, they thought they killed Jesus. They thought they destroyed everything that he was about and the resurrection totally confounded all of that. And that same spirit lives inside of us. So despite setbacks and difficulties and struggles, let the resurrection fill you with hope. Keep prompting you to share the gospel. Keep prompting you to minister to others and encourage others. And finally, Again, let the resurrection power of Jesus prompt you to share this good news with everyone in whom you meet. So can we pray? Father God, I thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. I thank you for this Easter Sunday morning where we celebrate the resurrection. And Lord, I pray, let it move us. Let it move us to be a people of good news. Let it move us to be a people of hope. Let it move us to be a people that share this good news with everyone that we meet. God, I ask and I pray for this. Let the reality of the resurrection of Jesus, God, fill the hearts and minds and lives of everyone, Lord, that is watching this message right now. I pray encouragement. I pray strength. I pray hope. I pray victory. I pray healing. I pray everything that the resurrection accomplished, Lord, in the lives and hearts of everyone that's watching this video. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, it was great to be with you. And until next week, I call you blessed. Happy Easter.